The White Pill is available now at whitepillbook.com. This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next however long this takes. Um, we have a very, very special episode. This is going to be a very long introduction, but let me introduce my guests first. First, we have my good friend Dave Smith, host of Part of the Problem. Uh, he is a legendary stand-up comedian, one-third Legion of Skanks. And also we have Constant Kissin, who is co-host of Trigonometry, whose show I did recently, and Constantine did my show a few weeks ago. Uh, the two of them got into it a little bit on Twitter in a very collegial way, and now they're here. <laughs> We're going to have a nice discussion about the situation over in Ukraine. And let me give my background on this because this is something I've been hit at with a lot. It's kind of interesting. Well, one of the things I resent is this idea um, that whatever issue the corporate press pushes at a given moment, everyone has to have an opinion on it, and they have to have an informed opinion on it and opinion immediately. A very good example of this is not that long ago transgender bathrooms and you have to have an opinion on transgender bathrooms and it's not even just transgender people right it's specifically the bathroom issue now you would think someone who's dealing with gender dysphoria there's birth certificates you know going on planes going to certain countries no you have to have an opinion on this issue and it has to be the same as mine or else you're out group in some capacity uh, i was born in ukraine it was the soviet union at the time constant you were born there as well you were not from ukraine you're from regular I was russia, born in russia yeah in russia okay uh, as a result of this, people especially like you really need to have an opinion on this issue. Well, here's my opinion. We left when I was two. I grew up, obviously, with those values, uh, such as they were in the West. Uh, it, Russian was my first language. I do not speak Ukrainian. We didn't leave because it was so nice. Uh, we left because it was oppressive. There was a, The level of anti-Semitism there was through the roof. However, uh, my friend Andrea Chalupa, who wrote the film Mr. Jones, she told me this is a relic of the past. For the past three years, I've been trying to go back to the motherland uh, with Chris Williamson. First, we had COVID. Now we have this whole war situation. Um, I am very uninformed in this issue for one specific reason. It is my belief, and I'm sure my guests will agree, that everything that we hear in the news about this is filtered through the vein of propaganda. It has to be viewed for the vein of propaganda because the Kremlin is watching all the news. Uh, Kiev is watching all the news. So if Zelensky, for example, wants to cut a deal with Putin and there's pressure on him in the back from the Americans or whoever else or NATO, we're not going to know about that. And he's, you know, he's going to, if Putin's ready to fold, he's not going to be in front of the cameras being like, guys, if you just give me this money, I'll pull out my troops. There's two other issues. One is uh, Putin is a bad guy, is in my opinion, but I don't, that doesn't mean if someone is a bad guy, that doesn't mean they're the bad guy in a specific situation. When North Korea is complaining that America can sell its technology to other countries and they're not allowed to, I don't think they're wrong. I also think Kim Jong-il should be have bad things done to him. I, I, I don't know if I could say that on YouTube. And he's a very evil dictator. I know a lot about North Korea. I wrote the book on North Korea. I don't know anything about South Korea. I know more about North Koreans living in, North, in South Korea than I do about South Koreans living in South Korea. So I think once countries leave totalitarianism, in my view, they kind of lose my personal interest. So I don't know that I have a horse in this race. My horse is with the Ukrainian people and the Russian people. I don't like people getting killed. Uh, there are children being killed, being made into orphans. There are also children being used as prop for propaganda purposes. I'd rather they be used for propaganda purposes than killed. But this is just a horrible situation. And I don't know that there's an easy answer. Uh, if people say, well, we can't let an aggressor invade a country and get away with it. Well, at a certain point, you have no choice, because if you're going to tell me nukes are on the table, you lost me, because I don't think nukes are on the table, in my opinion, no matter what uh, Putin does. So uh, you guys had different perspectives on this issue. This is my uninformed background, and I trust your, both of your opinions more than I do trust anything I hear in the news and certainly anything I hear on social media from people who can't find Ukraine on the map, who had never heard of it or referred to it as the Ukraine. Um, 
So that's kind of my two cents. We're not going to have a debate. We're going to have a friendly discussion because when you have a debate, there's no incentive to kind of concede the other mm -hmm. person's points or change your opinion. And I think that's just very counterproductive. So I'll defer to our foreign guest who speaks like he's still from the motherland, Constantin. What's your view on this whole situation? And uh, just just your thoughts broadly speaking well i i don't know where to start really i i think i, I may be better for dave to start only in the sense that my okay. position is kind of like the more may rarely for me the more mainstream kind of view so uh may, it might be better for dave to start i don't know that oh, uh, depends how you dave, feel dave, before you start i'm just gonna say one more thing something that drives me crazy is that the there's such an impetus to have an opinion on like any specific issue the press pushing at the moment that i've been accused of lying and that I don't want to talk about my opinion because it's going to offend people I know. And it's really, really bizarre. Another thing that we, I just recently heard is I was just cracking jokes at Dave when Constantine was on my show. Constantine didn't know me and Dave are good friends. Uh, and you tried to valiantly defend him. <laughs> and no, I wouldn't go that far. I just didn't want another <laughs> another person hating on me. That's all. Sure, like, sure. I wasn't defending him. I was just, but just being polite. I saw a comment that you were lying, that all of us podcasters are friends. And that, you know, so the degree to which people feel they are informed about what's in our heads is really kind of off the yeah. charts and astronomical. But Dave, I, I constant makes a good point. Why don't you give the uh, um, unorthodox perspective on what's going on over there? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, well, and thanks, Michael, for having us. I, I agree with a lot of what you said there. I was just thinking um, for me, just the most recent one was because uh, I don't know if you guys saw RFK and Crystal Ball had like this spat about uh, vaccines. And so it was just like, what's your take on vaccines causing autism? And you're like, I know nothing about it. That's my take on it. I just like I, I, I just anyway. So that, but enough about that. Um, so I guess what I think probably all three of us certainly could agree with is that what's happening in Ukraine right now is just a, a catastrophe. I mean, it's really just uh, goddamn so horrible. And mm -hmm. war is the worst thing in the world. It's insane that human beings still do it. It's insane that we're at this level of civilization and we still have these murder fests and we all kind of accept that this is just part of reality, like wars happen sometimes. And they bring out the absolute worst in people, um, the worst type of like uh, tribalism and a complete loss of humanity. Uh, we get very like this kind of binary tribal view and you're not allowed to think about any of the kind of nuance, you know, for, for example, like in, in World War II, you're supposed to have no humanity for German civil uh, civilians. Like, you know, like many of whom were the victims of the Nazis also, but you're just not supposed to like think like that. And one thing I would say about this conflict that I very rarely see um, mentioned is that both sides of it are being fought with conscripted armies. And I think that's something for people to keep in mind um, that this, uh, to me, conscription is akin to slavery and the worst type. Um, I think Vladimir Putin uh, is a war criminal. I think this war was illegal and immoral. Um, I guess that maybe I'd say three main points from where I think my perspective will probably differ um, from the mainstream on this. Uh, number one, I think that American politicians, and I'll throw some of the European politicians and, and NATO members as well into that, are just the absolute biggest hypocrites in the world to pretend that they are so morally outraged with Vladimir Putin because he's a war criminal and he invaded a country. I mean, it's just, it literally makes us the laughing stock to the entire world that is outside of the American empire, which is part of the reason why they're all joining together um, in this effort behind Russia. Because the idea that the most war hungry country in the world, the United States of America, who's fought seven wars over the last 20 years, um, is lecturing Vladimir Putin about how horrible this is. It just makes us the biggest hypocrites in the world. Um, number two, I would say that while this war is not justified, it was absolutely provoked by the West and that the American policy for 30 years, but particularly as of late, has just been picking a fight with Russia that was an absolutely unnecessary fight to pick. Um, and, the, you know, from NATO expansion to intervening in all types of countries that used to be uh, in in the Warsaw Pact, uh, backing coups in Ukraine, um, all, all types of different stuff that we can get into. How about, as we just got this Durham report, framing Vladimir Putin for overthrowing our democracy for the last five years? Um, just And not just like 
you know, Brian Stelter on CNN, but the head of the CIA saying that Vladimir Putin has overthrown democracy. Uh, just imagine how that reads from the perspective of someone outside the empire when you've slaughtered 4 million people and started seven wars over the last 20 years, and you're now claiming that this guy essentially committed an act of war against you. Um, and I, I then I would just close with, I think the current US policy, and I just can't overstate this enough, is the most insane, reckless policy I've ever seen. And the idea of just endlessly supporting a proxy war of choice on Russia's border, rather than pushing or insisting for negotiations to end the war as soon as possible, is madness. And it, I, I believe it has brought us closer to the possibility of a nuclear conflict than even during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, I, that's debatable, but that's my thought on it. And for anybody who thinks that like that's an impossibility or that that's off the table, um, as as Michael Malice would say, Ash Schooley, learn a book, um, because there's there were several close calls during uh, the Cold War where only but a few people stopped nuclear war from happening. And that is not something that is impossible. And the greatest priority in the history of the world is that America and Russia not go to nuclear war. So I guess I'll start with that and then whatever, where we want to go from there. Folks, as you know, one of the biggest reasons I moved down to Austin is so that I could get a firearm to protect myself and my home. And I'm delighted to welcome Vanish to the program. Now, you guys know that one of the surest paths toward oppression is giving up your guns or not having one when you need it, which is why I want to talk about a big mistake people make with their holsters. The mistake is they get one that's so uncomfortable you stop using it, meaning your quest to defend yourself or your family falls apart at the start. That's why the Vanish holster is quickly becoming one of the most popular holsters in America. Thousands of customers say it's the most comfortable holster ever. And when you get one, you'll never stop carrying. And it also saves you money. Because if it's 99% of all semi-automatic handguns, works without a tactical belt, lets you carry multiple positions, and carries two fully loaded magazines, best of all, because you're a dear reader and a supporter of our podcast, you get it for $50 off. Go to vnsh.com slash malice. Activate your discount today. It's normally $130. You get a steal as a You're Welcome fan. Go to vnsh.com slash malice today to claim your $50 discount. I am absolutely ecstatic to welcome them to the show. Let me build on something Dave said and, and let, uh -huh. you, let you speak. My, what I do know about is, is North Korea. And my big, big concern is that we see something similar to the Korean War, where you have China, Russia, and North Korea on one side, US, UN, uh, and South Korea on the other side. And it was the Korean people who paid the price and the country was effectively leveled. Uh, and that, you know, we're not putting ourselves in harm's way. And then Ukraine is just like turned into a massive slaughterhouse. The, the idea of that absolutely terrifies me. And I'm sure that's something that you're not particularly uh, amenable to either. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, first of all, I really appreciate the, the tone of this conversation. I, I really would like, love to continue that. Um, so from my perspective, I think, um, uh, first of all, I should say I have family in both countries, as maybe you do as well. And for me, uh, the fact that this is happening is, like Dave says, it's complete tragedy. Uh, and I care about people in both countries. Uh, I also think, though, at the same time, that you have to be realistic. As you probably know with the history of Ukraine, it's a country that has experienced this over and over and oh, over yeah. and over again. And that is because, to a large extent, geography is destiny. Uh, Ukraine is unfortunate in that it sits on the border of two great empires. It always has done and may well do for, for, for a long time in the future. So uh, my grandmother, who, who's 96 now, she lives in about 100 kilometers from the front line in Ukraine right now, Dnipro. And she lived through the Nazi occupation, and now she's living through this. And uh, this is something that is very, very frequent in Ukrainian history for mainly geographical reasons, more than anything which will come into play when we talk about NATO expansion in a second as well. right? But on the hypocrisy point, and this is where sometimes I think people get a little bit confused. I'm 100% where you are, Dave, in the sense that I oppose the war in Iraq. I oppose what happened in Afghanistan. I oppose many of the Western interventions in these countries that do nothing but destabilize them. Um, and the reason I oppose Russia's invasion of Ukraine is exactly the same reason that I oppose America's invasion of Iraq. I think, to me, that is a very consistent point, which is large empires shouldn't invade small countries uh, and kill their people because it suits them for their own political or corporate, whatever other interest. And so um, from a hypocrisy point of view, it's, I, I don't disagree. 
but I'm also on your side when it comes to all those invasions, right? So I think that's an important point to make. You can oppose both at the same time. Um, in terms of the, uh, I, I think the main point of disagreement, which is what we got into on Twitter, I think, and what, what the real core of the disagreements about this entire conflict are in the West, in this kind of fringe of the conversation that we're in, is, you know, was Russia provoked? Is it therefore our fault? And this is the John Meyer Scheimer argument. Uh, and um, what's this Russian guy, Vladimir Pozner? He makes the point as well, which is that, you know, Vladimir Putin wanted to join forces with the West after 9-11. He extended a hand of friendship. He wanted to uh, even suggested that Russia should join NATO, uh, and we rejected that, and now we've provoked him into, into becoming what he is. This I don't think is true at all, um, and when we talk about the Warsaw Pact, we should be clear how the Warsaw Pact was formed. So we're going to talk a little bit about history here. I don't want to go too deep into it, but if you look at the countries which are offering the most financial support to Ukraine at the moment in, in percentage of GDP terms, right, those are country. Those countries are Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Sweden, Finland, Norway, um, and the other countries that have a border with Russia. Right. So all of these four, many of these are former Soviet countries or countries like Finland, which were part of the Russian Empire, uh, but uh, uh, weren't part of the Soviet Union. Uh, all of these countries oppose what Russia is doing and are risking quite a lot, actually, in terms of themselves provoking Russia by giving money and weapons and support to Ukraine at a higher level in percentage terms than even the United States or the UK. Uh, and the reason they're doing that is they understand that this is what Russia does every time that Russia gets strong. Yeah. So if we talk about provoking Russia, my view is, uh, I don't disagree, by the way, that pushing NATO closer to Russia's borders is a source of irritation and threat to Russia. This is a fact. And so I don't disagree that there's an element of that provocation. But the reason all those countries were desperate to join NATO is, for example, if you take Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, these countries were never part of Russia. These countries were conquered first by the Nazis and then by Stalin in, 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 the, in the deal that they did to divide all of Eastern Europe. So these were not countries that want to be associated with Russia, and none of these countries do. And the other thing about Ukraine is that Ukraine's westward trajectory started in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed or split up, however you want to talk about it. So my grandfather in Ukraine, the day that that happened, started speaking Ukrainian even though he was from a Russian-speaking area, uh, spoke Russian to me all his life, but he suddenly switched. And that's because people felt this kind of resurgence of national identity and they wanted to move away. So I always use this example. Uh, you know, uh, double what we call double glazing in the UK, uh, like windows which have two panes of glass, which keeps the heat in, right? That yep. didn't, we didn't have that in the Soviet Union, as your parents probably told you. And that was a Western thing. And in Ukraine, they were called Euro windows. Everything that was good came from Europe yep. and everything that was bad came from Russia. And so people had started to move away psychologically and wanted to be part of the West because they saw it as the place where you have freedom, you have opportunity, you have money, etc. So this was always going to happen. And, and so when we talk about, well, the coup in 2014, I have a very different view of that because the history of that particular event is very different to, to the way that people talk about it. I don't want to, I feel like I'm talking for a long time here. No, no, this is useful. Okay, well, if I may then, and I'm very happy for Dave to talk at length in response. Uh, in 2014, what happened was uh, President Yanukovych, who was the Russian, the Vladimir Putin's puppet, you know, they would have daily phone calls with Putin telling him what to do and whatever. He promised to sign a trade agreement with the European Union. And then at the last moment, pulled out of that and instead decided to sign a trade agreement with Russia. A small number of students came out and protested about this, and they were badly brutalized by the police this provoked more people to come out in the streets and they weren't really protesting about the trade agreement no one cared about that particularly or not many people did i mean trade agreements don't animate a lot of you know a lot of people generally uh, but what animates people is when you've got police beating up protesters particularly in a country like ukraine which culturally is different to russia uh, the, there isn't the same sort of acceptance of totalitarian power the the riot police coming in and smashing people over the head and that caused the Maidan revolution, where essentially they were like, look, this, this government is illegitimate because of the level of force it is using against protesters. 
Uh, and then you saw what happened later with hundreds of protesters being shot by snipers and, and all of that. So that now in terms of backing the revolution, there's clear evidence that the US and other European countries were supportive of it in the same way that the French were supportive of the American Revolution. I mean, this is what always happens in revolutions. Foreign powers come in and they back the side that they feel is the right one for them to back. It's inevitable. And the, the country in which you, you boys live wouldn't exist without that yeah. same thing, right? Final point, in terms of the nuclear escalation and uh, getting the, the war to stop, I, I've said from day one, I want this to be over as soon as possible. Yep. Uh, I, I completely support that. Now, there is a slight concern that I have with this argument, though, which is this is exactly what we did in 2014. Russia annexed Crimea. Russia started a low level kind of not civil war exactly, but sort of uprising in the east of Ukraine, backed the rebels, gave them money, gave them weapons, etc. Uh, and we kind of in the West went, well, we don't want to interfere, nuclear war, escalation, you know, it's Russia, let's not. And and what happened was Russia then kept going, right? So if we're talking about saving lives, sometimes you have to think in a long-term way, what is the right position long-term as opposed to let's just get this over quickly right now and then you're back at the same situation eight years later. So I've said from day one, I personally, and by the way, Ukrainians, some of them don't like me saying this, but it is true. I don't think Ukraine... Uh, it's worth tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian lives to preserve pieces of the Donbass that no one really cares about. They've been under rebel control for eight years anyway. And Crimea, you know, this is a slightly different conversation, but again, Ukraine can survive without Crimea, not that big a deal. However, what Ukraine does need is long-term security. It needs the guarantee that this can never happen again. And what that means, I'm afraid, is that Ukraine, look, there's two, two, two options there. You mentioned one of them, which is the Korean scenario, which is you have a DMZ in the middle, some kind of peacekeeping force on the border, which not a good outcome. Nope. But the other outcome is, I'm afraid, if we're talking about long term security, is Ukraine joins NATO, because that's the only thing that's going to guarantee that it's safe. Now, as we sit here, neither of those options would be acceptable to Russia. And right. so if we're talking about resolving this conflict, uh, you can't stop a war that both sides still want to fight. The only option we have is to pull our support from the Ukrainians, let them get slaughtered, and then the war is over, right? Uh, that's what would happen. And the way that people in Ukraine feel, particularly because of what happened in 2014, like I remember on the first day, I called up a friend and I said to him in Kiev, and I said, listen, man, I talked to some people in the British government and intelligence people Ukraine's going to fold. And I was wrong about that, but that's what that's what everybody was saying. You need to take your family and you need to leave. I'll help you any way I can. Just just get out, please. And he was like, I'm, my family, I've already arranged for them, but I'm staying. We are fighting. This is our land. This is our country. We're not letting this happen again. And this guy isn't some gym bro. He's an IT consultant with a beer belly, right? So the sentiment in Ukraine is such that they're not going to give up their country willingly. They will fight with sticks if that's what they have to fight with, and they will get slaughtered if that's what happens. So from that perspective, there is no easy way to resolve this. Uh, otherwise, it would already be resolved. In terms of nuclear escalation, this is a really good point. I mean, any any tension between the, the world's superpowers elevates the risk of nuclear escalation. However, in a world where we have nuclear weapons, we cannot allow the use, the potential use of them or another country having them to mean that we never push back on anything, right? Otherwise, why don't we let Russia take all of Europe? I mean, that, that would be the argument. Let's not have a nuclear escalation. So while I completely agree, nuclear war is obviously the worst thing that could happen to humanity. Although on some days when I open Twitter, I think maybe it would be the best thing to happen to humanity. But you know what I mean, right? Like the the from my perspective, of course, we, we need to do everything we possibly can to eliminate that risk as much as we can. But on the other hand, we also have to make sure that we are asserting the things that we need to be asserting in order to prevent nuclear weapons being used as a bullying stick against other countries. So that's kind of my point. And Dave, I'm sorry I've been speaking for as long as I have. Uh, you know, uh, please go ahead. Folks, did you know that traditional bed sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat? It could lead to acne, allergies, stuffy noses, and it is gross. 
Miracle Maid offers a whole line of self cleaning, eco friendly bedding such as sheets, pillowcases, and comforters that prevent 99% of bacteria and requires three times less laundry. They use silver infused fabrics originally inspired by NASA. Miracle Maid sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long. You get better sleep every night. And they're infused with silver that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner, fresher, three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odors. You know who you are. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands. Feel as nice, if not nicer, than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Clean sheets means less bacteria to clog your pores, fewer breakouts, and other skin problems as a result. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And with Father's Day right around the corner, this is the perfect way to give someone you love the gift of better and more luxurious sleep. Save over 40%. Be sure to use promo code malice at checkout to save even more. And they'll give you three free towels. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice. Use code malice to claim your three-piece towel set. That's free. Save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash malice to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. Let's get back to the show. I'd love to hear Dave respond, but there's something else that I just, when you were talking constant, that made me realize that there's two narratives that are completely contradictory in, in the media. One mm-hmm. is this kind of Thatcher and the Falklands Kuwait narrative, which is you cannot allow a foreign invader to aggress and get any uh, like rewards for their aggression. Like they have to be back to zero or even punished. Otherwise they'll do it again. At mm-hmm. the same time, if there was a deal cut tomorrow uh, and, and, Zelensky is like, all right, you get the Donbass, you and you, we're, you know, you guarantee us our border security for a hundred years. Everyone would cheer. So it's just really kind of amazing how you have these two complete contradictory ideas in the press, and no one ever sits down. And is like, well, which one is it? Is it like they can't gain an inch, or it would be great if they gained an inch and we got in exchange for peace? Well, Dave, I'd love to hear your look, thoughts, Dave. About- I'm so okay. sorry. May I just make one other point? Yeah, sure. Of course. Brought it up. Um, on that though, th- th- this isn't entirely. An accurate framing, in my opinion, because okay. Ukraine getting its long term security is a huge red line for Russia. Right. So uh, in, if you're saying, well, we don't want we, we need to push back on them, Ukraine joining NATO, which is really the only way you guarantee their security, is a huge win for Ukraine and a huge loss for Russia. So. Do you see what I mean? But so there isn't actually I, I, that contradiction. I know what you mean. Like what that. I'm saying is in the WWE uh, narrative that we're portraying <laughs> the press, if Putin gains a single inch, uh, that cannot be allowed to happen at any cost. Like that's, yeah, that's the mean. method being portrayed, yeah, which yeah, none yeah. of us agree with. Yeah. Right. Uh, ahead, well, the, the attitude, the thinking in Washington, D.C., as they like to say, is right. That like we can't just allow a nuclear superpower to invade uh, another country and suffer no consequences. And that's from us, the biggest nuclear power that invades more countries than anybody else in the world. Um, so uh, the the reality is like, I mean, if you're talking about consequences, like, yes, in a perfect world, George W. Bush and Dick Cheney and Vladimir Putin and Obama and all of them should all be in underneath the a maximum security prison for all of their crimes against humanity. But in the reality of the world, um, these very powerful nuclear countries can get away with a lot of things and not mm-hmm. suffer the consequences that they should. I, I, I want to try to address a lot of the stuff you said there because it's uh, there's a lot that I agree with, but I think there's there's also more to the story. So I think you're right, essentially, about uh, a lot of these countries in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union wanting to westernize. And I think exactly for the reasons that you said, not because of the way we conducted the Cold War, not because we fought a war in Vietnam or any of that, but because they wanted nicer things. They wanted like blue jeans and movies and like, as you said, like windows that insulate, you know, from cold air and just the things that are kind of natural human desires. I also think there was a tremendous amount of this in Russia. Um, And I know this is somewhat anecdotal, but there's lots of stories of like American scholars going up immediately after the fall of the Soviet Union. And they were like treated like it was so cool, like you're a rock star because you're an American coming over here. I think, um, unfortunately, um, largely driven by the neoconservatives, we squandered a lot of that goodwill in the post uh, in in the post Soviet um, years in the 90s, and particularly with the first round of NATO expansion, um, and then with the subsequent expansions after that. I understand why uh, Eastern European countries would want to be in NATO, 
I certainly have no argument with that. Of course, who wouldn't want the most powerful military in the history of the world to sign up to defend you? <laughs> you know, we're going to subsidize your defense and and guarantee that if anyone attacks you, there will at least help in the uh, in your defense project, whatever Article Five exactly promises. Um, my perspective is that we shouldn't have done it. Um, that you know that there, it's ridiculous for us to sign up to defend, just as George Kennan. Um, the Cold Warrior, the founder of the containment strategy, said during the first round of NATO expansion that we've signed up to, to defend a whole host of countries that we don't have the resources or the political will to defend. That we're just and and there's a there's another type of like moral hazard that comes with y y like these these um this is what the advice of the founders George Washington himself was talking about avoiding these entangling alliances. There's a whole other type of moral hazard that comes along, particularly with American strength, because we now in in these countries to do things that they wouldn't necessarily otherwise do if they didn't feel like the biggest bully had their back. Um, this is why John Mearsheimer said in 2014, when Victoria Newland and all these other people were talking about how wonderful the Maidan revolution is and how great it is that there's this new government that's going to join the EU in Ukraine. And John Mearsheimer said, America is leading Ukraine down the primrose path, which I have since learned is comes from Shakespeare. And the idea is just that, oh, you're leading them down this path that looks so beautiful, but it ends in your demise. And we can look at the reality of the situation and who was more correct about what type of path they were being led down. Um, but so to me, look, there's this, um, there's this memo, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, entitled Nyet means Nyet. Uh, it was written by uh, the current head of the CIA, Bill Burns. Um, and we only know this uh, because Julian Assange sacrificed his life to, to get it to us. Um, this was a private cable from Burns, who was at the time the um, he at the time he was the ambassador to Russia, and he sent it back to Condoleezza Rice. This is in 2008, in George W. Bush's final year as as president. And he the memo is titled "Nyet means Nyet." You can find it on the internet. And in 2008, in February, he wrote back to Condoleezza Rice, and he was like, look, I just met with Sergei Lavrov, and I've been talking to all of the highest people, uh, you know, in the Russian government, inside and outside of the establishment. And it is, like, unanimous to a man that Ukrainian entry into NATO is the brightest of red lines for Vladimir Putin. And, and he says in a subsequent memo, he goes, not just Vladimir Putin, his sharpest liberal critics, everybody is unanimous on this, that th this is their... Um, Cuban Missile Crisis. This is there. You, your military alliance cannot extend to our biggest neighbor, Ukraine. This is off the table. And he says in the memo that uh, that NATO, uh, Ukrainian entry into NATO could, they're very worried that it could lead to a civil war in Ukraine, at which point the uh, Russia would have to decide whether they uh, or not to intervene. And his words, the current CIA director's words in 2008 were, a choice the Russians do not want to have to make. And I think that Okay, so four months after that, at the Bucharest summit, they announced that Ukraine and Georgia are joining NATO. And like, this was against the wishes of the Germans. This was just the idiot war criminal George W. Bush insisting on pushing this through because all of the idiot neocons from their project for a new American century back in the 90s had this brilliant plan of we're going to entirely remake the Middle East and we're going to expand NATO all the way to Russia's borders. And so they pushed this through. And like, I mean, you kind of conceded at one point that, yes, this kind of did provoke the Russians. I mean, v Vladimir Putin for years was screaming at the top of his lungs that I have real security concerns about this. And nobody would listen. No, the Americans would laugh. They're treating him like he's Saddam Hussein. Who cares what he thinks? We're America. We can do whatever we want to. Except he's not Saddam Hussein. He's sitting on the biggest stockpile of nuclear weapons in the history of the world. Like, And, and, there, and, and he's saying, eventually, I'm going to do something about this. And... Um, it was just completely unnecessary. It was stupid. There was it wasn't even really going to happen, at least not at the time. Germany was not going to do it. And why was Germany not going to do it? Because they knew it would provoke uh, the Russians and that this had like catastrophic implications. And there's no reason to do it. There was no reason. And as far as like, you know, talking about the, uh, the made on revolution in 2014, it's not even, I don't even think necessarily anything you said about it is wrong. I think there's just a lot of information that's left out there. Like number one, that like Yanukovych absolutely did like run on joining the EU. And I think he meant it. At least that's what it seems like at the time. Cause he was actually arguing with a lot of the people in his own camp. It was a very difficult um, political tightrope to walk. Because 
most of his base was not for it. And most of his opposition was for it. And so this makes a, it a politically difficult thing to achieve. Um, but also the EU changed the deal on him and they were demanding strict, um, uh, uh, strict um, pension cuts. Uh, what's the term then? Like austerity measures. Um, they were also demanding all these anti-corruption measures, which, you know, of course, corruption is an interesting term, the way governments define it. Like we, we think of Ukraine as a very corrupt, co like America and, and kind of like uh, Western European countries, they kind of look down at, at countries where there's like, um, kind of more like obvious low level corruption, you know, like you get caught with a speeding ticket, you can give the cops some money. Like that doesn't really happen in America. You can't really pay off a cop. If you have you lots of situations you wish you could, but you can't pay off a cop in America. But like the prison, you know, uh, the prison guards union lobbies to keep mandatory minimums for marijuana. <laughs> you know, like, so like we have corruption in a much more institutionalized way. But anyway, they, they offered him a very tough deal. And then Vladimir Putin came in and offered him a much better deal. And he offered him the same amount of loans. I forget what it was, five or 15 billion dollars uh, um, with low interest and no strings attached. No, no IMF, you know, like uh, uh, stuff. And so and, and he went with that deal. Now, in terms of like the protesters who were who first came out in uh, late 2013, I mean, I don't know, uh, like on George Soros's own website, he brags about how the NGOs were like instrumental in getting those protesters out. That's not to say those weren't real protesters. Um, I'm not saying they were CIA agents, um, but they're. There's been billions of dollars poured into Ukraine since 1991, both U.S. taxpayer dollars, billions of U.S. taxpayer dollars, plus a whole lot of money from these NGOs that are not technically, you know, U.S. tax dollars, but certainly from the Russian perspective are all part of the same apparatus. They kept to keep this thing going through the winter, and you know this, they turned it into like a freaking carnival because it was through the Ukrainian winter to keep the protesters on the streets. You had celebrities and heat lamps and stages. They turned it into a huge thing to keep it going. And it's absolutely true that Yanukovych cracked down brutally on those protesters. I mean, just horrific stuff. Uh, dragging them out naked in the streets and stuff like really really horrible and i think it's definitely true that that backfired and that got more people protesting in the streets um there were some very very nasty elements in those protesters and i think you know that um i'm not suggesting that ukraine is a nazi country or something like that i'm not suggesting that anything close to even a majority of the protesters were uh, neo-Nazis, but there is no debate that there were neo-Nazi elements to it, and they were some of the most violent um, people in those protests. As one of those uh, members of C-14, uh, 14, I believe, comes from the 1488, uh, you know, um, these are the real swastika up crazy neo-Nazis, the grandsons of the S escalation. Um, they, he said, the way he put it was he said, well, look, we were only like 10% of, of the street putsch, but without us, it was the gay pride parade. Like we were the ones who were like getting it done. And look, I mean, there, there's a lot, and, and this isn't just conspiracy theory stuff, but there's, there's been like some scientific studies into that whole sniper event. And it's, let's say at best unclear what exactly happened there, but the broad strokes of it. And, and during this, by the way, you, of course, you have Victoria Newland in the street, handing out sandwiches to people. You have John McCain and uh, Senator Murphy going over there. Senator Murphy brags on C-SPAN that it was American policies that ousted Yanukovych and probably wouldn't have happened without us. And ultimately you have a, a you have a democratically elected uh, president in Yanukovych, elections verified by the EU. Um, and you have America backing a bloody street putsch. And they came to a deal. They work out a deal in the end where uh, Yanukovych says he'll pull his police forces back if the protesters pull back. And he agreed to hold early elections. And they agreed to the deal. And he pulled his pro police uh, back. And then the protesters seized all of the government building and he fled for his fucking life. And like, mm -hmm. yeah. And then the next day, the Obama administration recognized the new government. And the, to me, that is 100% a U.S.-backed coup. And, and with no thought of what, like, why would we do this? Why would we take the risk of provoking this conflict with Russia? You know, you mentioned earlier uh, when you were talking about, like, should we let Russia take all of Europe? I mean, Russia, at least before the war, I don't know exactly where it is now, but Russia had a GDP of $1.5 trillion. It's, it's a fourth, a fourth, less than a fourth 
of our federal government's budget. Our federal government spends four Russia's entire economies every year. And being the world empire, we're going broke. We're 30 plus trillion dollars in debt. We can't afford it. There's no chance that Russia could afford this. Russia's struggling with Ukraine right now. They're not moving on Poland. They're not taking over half of Europe. It's just, this is not going to happen. The, I'm not saying because someone has nuclear weapons, they should be allowed to do whatever they want to do. I'm saying if someone has nuclear weapons, don't provoke a conflict with them. Like that to me is, is kind of the center of this. And just because there were a lot of things you said, I just want to try to address um, a couple others. You know, with the idea of like Estonia and, and these countries contributing a higher percentage of their GDP to the fight. Um, oh, all right. I'm not, I don't care what other governments do, you know, like that's, they can do that if they want to. Um, the fact that it's a higher percentage of GDP is, is one thing. Uh, it's indicate it, it indicates something, but who's contributing the most money by magnitudes of order is the United States of America. And it would not be having the impact that we are having, you know, like if, if we weren't doing that. And so may, if those countries want to, uh, contribute to this, if they, if they take the, um, the, the calculation that you know, this might provoke Russia, but we think it's in our interest that Russia loses this war. Okay, fine. American foreign policy should be based around what's in America's interest. And it is not in America's interest to, it is not worth any threat of nuclear war. It's not worth any threat of, of a war with Russia uh, over whether the Don, like whether the Donbass region is ruled by Kiev or Moscow is immaterial to American interests. And I'm, I want people to stop dying that just as a human being, I want them to, but there's no, there's no reason for America to be involved in this, in this conflict at all. And then just the final thing I'll say before I'll turn it back over uh, to you is that there is solid reporting. And this was from Fiona Hill, who's no like anarchist dove like me This is Fiona Hill, the never Trumper. Um, but she wrote this piece. It was co-authored. I can't remember the other author. Uh, and this was, um, I think it was in the Washington post, maybe foreign affairs. Um, but they said that Zelensky and Putin had essentially agreed in principle to the terms of, of a deal. And that Boris Johnson, your boy, uh, went over yeah. there and, uh, and, and persuaded them on behalf of the Americans to not negotiate. And that is the position of so many people. That is the position of so many pundits and so many po people in the political class that there, there would be no negotiations. In fact, um, what, it was um, the, uh, Victoria Nuland, who was very instrumental in the, the coup in 2014, um, wife of, uh, of Robert Kagan, um, like the top level neocon, worst people in the world. Um, she was the one who said, yes, that they got to be out of Crimea. But that's part of, that will not happen. That's not happening. There is no practicality to it. Uh, Vladimir Putin, you know, you mentioned him invading Crimea and that we didn't do anything about that. That was obviously a response to the re to the revolution in 2014 or the coup, as I would call it. But that was obviously a response to that and them threatening to tear up the lease to his only warm water naval port there. And the invasion was essentially bloodless. It was a coup de main. I don't know, like the, maybe three people died or something, and it's not even clear that it was Russian forces who killed them. The people of Crimea overwhelmingly sided with being part of Russia. And I know mm. you could question the plebiscites and things like that and whether they were legitimate. Yeah, but there's I will. yeah, that's fine. But there's independent polling that backs that up. I mean, there, there was no fight to be had there. The Vladimir uh, Putin's soldiers went outside their naval base and they were not being kicked out of there. It let's, just wasn't going to happen. You, you put a lot on the table and let's get Konstantin a chance to respond, respond well, to that. And this I was inevitably going to go this way. Sorry, uh, Michael, go for it. I was just going to say one point. What Dave touched on is my biggest concern, mm -hmm. which is that there is behind the scenes moves between Ukraine and Russia to cut a deal. And there's pressure from the West to keep this going in perpetuity. And that is, to me, like my biggest concern here. Go ahead, OK, Carson. well, Michael, can I actually ask you then, why don't you maybe pick out like two or three things that you think are really important? Because otherwise, Dave and I are going to get into the yeah. weeds of all of this stuff, which I think we've already done, to be honest. Sure. And, sure. and then I, if I, I start to rebut everything you said before we know what we're going to be Sure. deep in, in stuff that no one cares about sure uh, uh one you of the things that to be fair What's i that? did oh i'm not blaming you, you i definitely did it. yeah so it's just, I was, I was well michael to... started it by initiating this discussion that's usually the case that's I, usually the way, case. I, I started it on twitter but for the record for anyone go look at the tweets i didn't say anything about you i was just talking about bill clinton the oh, rapist. oh brother that's no there's, there's no hard feelings sometimes I, I don't have enough blood sugar and i get, I the, get angry. the only hard I, feelings I were 
the only hard feelings were when I was making fun of Dave to you, Constantine, and he got so offended that when he was in Austin, he didn't bother to even call me. Um, <laughs> here are the few points that I will. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. If you've been on the fence about buying gold and silver, have you seen what's going on? Silicon Valley bank collapse, bank governments having to bail them out with our taxpayer money. Saudi Arabia is meeting with China to accept the yuan for oil purchases. Is the end of the petrodollar? I don't know. Xi Jinping is meeting with Putin in Russia. And behind the scenes, while we aren't paying attention, MasterCard, Citigroup, and other global banking giants have started a digital dollar pilot, what they call Biden bucks. Biden's fast track this development. What does that mean? That means that the Fed will be able to monitor every transaction and devalue purchasing power even more. You know where else they have digital money? China. China's digital currency helps the CCP punish or coerce citizens with their social credit system. And if a citizen commits even a minor infraction, they can be blacklisted from traveling, going to restaurants, renting a home, having insurance. You don't think that could happen here? According to Bloomberg, the world is in the midst of a macroeconomic reset and the shining star is gold, which may be your best protection against all these mega threats. The Wall Street Journal has stated that gold prices may be headed for record highs this year. So call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. Mention my name, Michael Malice, and you'll always get best-in-class service from Patriots, protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold or silver, and you may be eligible for the No Fee for Life IRA and qualifying rollovers. All you got to do is call 888-505-9845 to get a free investor guide or go to malicegold.com. It's easy. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top-rated gold IRA dealer six years in a row. So call 888-505-9845 or go to malicegold.com to protect your assets and secure your future. Let's get back to the show. Here are the few points I want, want to address. I do want to hear your thoughts about 2014 okay. because I think a lot of times the backstory is certainly not discussed in our media coverage from from if you just had this kind of corporate media perspective putin just overnight decided to invade uh, ukraine and this is stalin part two and that's a very black and white situation the holiday more so there's nothing to even discuss here so that i think is key to understanding this whole situation and i'd love to hear your thoughts on that and crimea Okay, so uh, 2014, I mean, Dave mentioned a few different points. So uh, you mentioned, by the way, right when we started anti-Semitism in, in Ukraine. Um, and uh, Dave mentioned that there was there were some far right elements in the protests in 2014, which is absolutely true. Uh, and that's because Ukraine, like every country in Eastern Europe, uh, and frankly, every country in Europe has a history of Nazism. I mean, and, and not not just it's not really Nazism. It's it's more fascism. Uh, it, it's a fine distinction. But um, so during World War Two, there were a lot of collaborators uh, with the Nazis in east in in the west of Ukraine, and throughout uh, Europe. Really, I mean, most people don't know this, but uh, one of the units defending the, the 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 Reichstag in the last days of the of Hitler's Third Reich was. Um, SS Charlemagne, which was full of French Nazis. So the, the, this this um, movement of fascism was very common in Europe at the time. And so Ukraine, like any other country in, in that region, like Russia itself, by the way, has an, an RT element and, and, and they absolutely exist. Um, uh, my issue with it, Dave, and I know you didn't say anything like that, and I'm sure you never have, is like, oh, Ukrainians are all Nazis or there's loads of Nazis. And I'm like, I fly to Ukraine before the war two or three times a year from London and every fucking time it's me and 300 Hasidic Jews who are on a pilgrimage to Uman. Uh, so, you know, like that, that, that's something I just wanted to, to put on the table, but in terms of 2014, wait, can I, can I have yeah. you build on that point? Because this is something I think is very key because yeah. my, uh, my family fled in part, we're all Jewish. My family fled in part because of anti-Semitism. And you hear this talk about the Azov battalion all the time. At mm -hmm. the same time, I'm, I'm living in a country where Kellyanne Conway and Stephen Miller and literally anyone who's ever met Trump is considered a Nazi. Right. So can you speak on, is this Azov battalion? Can, can this I just say, by the way, yeah, just yeah, very quickly that, I, so I agree with you. And I even made that point that yet yeah, people do mischaracterize it and kind of be like, oh, it's a Nazi country or even that the made on like like protesters were all nazis is right. all all of that stuff is silly it was it was a an element in the crowd but there is also another thing like i kathy young debated uh scott horton on this topic and there's something very funny about these people who like to your point michael malice who, who like uh would say you know if you talked about proud boys or any group like that it's like all nazi scott every trump supporter is a nazi all of these are just horrible but then when she's talking about the azov battalion she goes 
Yes, it's true that it was founded by a neo-Nazi, but they've since moderated some of their Nazi. To- and, and so there's just this very bizarre right, take from everyone where they just mm-hmm. like, they, they will, everyone's a Nazi until there, someone's a Nazi and it doesn't really jive with your politics. Well, and then you're kind of Let like, me give you a non-bizarre take on that then. Yeah, so please, in terms of the Azov Battalion specifically, um, it was founded by a Nazi and I'm pretty sure it is full of Nazis. And the only thing that moderated them is that most of them, many of them were killed defending uh, Mariupol. Uh, I, I'm not saying they're all Nazis. I'm sure there's some very good people. They'll find people on they're both sides. Is what I'm, they're very fine people on both sides. <laughs> I find Nazis. What I say. <laughs> uh, but you know, you know what I mean, right? So I, I, no one can give you an exact percentage. I'm sure that there's a very significant contingent of them that were far right. What I would say about that, however... In addition to what I said about fascism being very common in Eastern Europe in particular, is that if you look at when the Azov Battalion was created and what it was created in response to, it's created in response to the Russian occupation right. of Crimea and Russian support for the rebels in the East, right? So if, if Mexico was four times the size of the United States and it invaded America, I'm pretty sure some of the guys who would volunteer to go and fight from the American side a few of them might be actual white supremacists. So do you see yes. what I'm, I'm saying, right? Of course, so sure. uh, that's, I think, the point that people miss is like whenever your country gets invaded by a foreign force, you're going to get all those people who are violent, who are extremists, who, who are going to be the first to jump, you know, pick up a, their AR-15 and head, head to the border. So what I think is important to say, though, is that's not representative of the country, certainly not representative of the government, Right. Uh, or, or, or their approach to the conflict or anything like that, you know, and uh, there are, I know I personally know people who came who are Jewish Ukrainians who went to places like Israel just because they wanted a better quality of life, who actually came back to to defend Ukraine and fight in the conflict. Right. That wouldn't be happening if it was a country right like that right uh and by the way i've lived in both russia and ukraine i promise you there is no difference in the level of anti-semitism between those two countries right so it's the not dog relevant. goes to 11 <laughs> yeah it's just all, but up to 11 in both countries exactly um so in terms of but 2014 is your your key point here um that they were they were an element now of course that guy is going to come out and say without us it would be a gay pride parade that's completely not true i have friends who were there they don't fit into either category right that they don't they don't they're not rainbow people but they're also not nazis at all there was a lot of very ordinary people just normal people who felt very strongly about it and uh you know your point about america's interference i think is valid but i, I made the point earlier about the American Revolution couldn't happen without French support. It's kind of the same thing. This this is what happens. And Russia, as you well know, has pumped in a shit ton of money in Ukraine for the exact opposite reason. So it's not like, you know, Ukraine was sitting there all neutral and the evil American capitalist pig dogs came along and started pumping money in. It, this is a battleground between two empires, which takes us right back to the very beginning of what I said, which is this is kind of Ukraine's geographical destiny to some extent um, but, but why Michael, would america why would this be america like the geography is that america is five thousand miles away from it yeah like, I, I agree with you that like the yes russia certainly is intervening in ukraine there, i don't think anyone is is denying that way way before the maidan revolution like a, I, yeah russia's intervening for sure but it would almost like i think america should stop intervening in mexico we intervene quite a bit our dea agents go well, over let, there but, but I'm just saying, like, like we do intervene there. But if Vladimir Putin traveled over to Mexico to then intervene on the other side, I think the more reasonable thing is like, hey, you have no business being here. And that's that applies to America. This is why we have a Monroe Doctrine. And I think it's reasonable for him to say, hey, my Monroe Doctrine applies to Ukraine. OK, but I'm sorry. Anyway, I didn't mean to cut you off. OK, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. So so th- the situation in terms of this battle of these two civilizations, this is what this re- really is about, is we are left over in the post World War Two conflict with a standoff in Europe between America and Russia or the Soviet Union. Right. That is what happened. Uh, that's not something we're going to be able to change on a podcast. That that That's how it is. And so the reason America is involved in Europe and in Eastern Europe is because that is the, the world order that we've inherited. That, you know, that that kind of more libertarian worldview and isolationist worldview that you're talking about hasn't really been in place in in, in for 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 a century. Right. So and and, and by the way, if it did, 
it is quite clear to me you know you talked earlier about russia's small gdp and that's something i've talked about as well but it's not really about gdp you say well look how much they're struggling in ukraine they wouldn't be struggling if it wasn't for western support ukraine would have folded in the first few days and uh countries like latvia estonia lithuania they would all be under russian subjugation now and probably much of the rest of europe too if it wasn't for the fact that those countries are part of nato now is it in America's interest to allow Russia to control all of Europe? I think we can all agree that it isn't, or I certainly would argue that it isn't, because the world is complicated. I mean, the post-World War II order is such that America has its physical security and is therefore providing defense to everybody else. But a lot of the other stuff that makes America prosperous and wealthy and safe and free, etc., is because of the empire that it's built, including in Europe. The connection between Europe and America is one of the reasons that you guys and us have benefited from prosperity and safety and relative freedom and so on, right? So uh, this is where I think the, the key disagreement might be in terms of geopolitics is this idea that if America just pulled out of everywhere, the world would go, go to this kind of special rosy place with unicorns and rainbows is it, just not accurate at all. Um, and so uh, that I think is another point. And Michael, do you want to pick up on some other stuff that you think well, is important? Well, let me just say that, that it yeah. is a bit of a straw man to say that my argument is that the world would go to a, ra a rosy place. It was a joke. So I didn't, sorry, I didn't mean no, to be no, a dick. Fair enough, but I'm just making the point that we would not be involved in this conflict and we wouldn't be risking like further Perfect. escalation between the two biggest nuclear uh, powers in the world. And that Perfect. we, you know, that we, we are not the, the idea, and, and it's not for the record, I'm not an isolationist, I'm a non-interventionist. I'm a completely free trade uh, you know, person, I believe yeah. in, in like our economic partnerships. I think mean, be friends with all nations and fight wars only when you're defending your own country. Um, mm -hmm. So d d that might be semantics, but from my perspective, it's not isolationist at all. Um, but the, the point is that America is not the benevolent good guys here who go around like solving all of these problems. In fact, we are the biggest terrorists on the planet. And if you look, and there's really, objectively speaking, I don't think there's much of an argument to that. As horrible as it is what Vladimir Putin's done in Ukraine, if you tally up what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and Libya and Somalia and Yemen over the last 20 years, and there's more, by the way, count the drone bomb campaign in Pakistan. I mean, there's a whole bunch of it. There's just no, com there's no comparison. And I don't think that the butcherers of the Middle East um, and Northern Africa are the ones who ought to be, you know, fueling proxy wars on Russia's border. Um, I, now, your point about like Russia would have just rolled over Ukraine had we not, you know, poured a hundred billion dollars in with pledges of much more. That that's probably true. Um, I also think this war would be long over. And I also think, and this isn't just something I'm wildly speculating on, there's been like admirals talking about this in the New York Times, and there's been lots of high-level people saying that the goal here, in fact, is to prolong the war, and that the mm. goal here is to bleed the Russians dry. But, and, and this is something we've done before. Um, Zbigniew uh, Brzezinski bragged about this in his memoirs, that they lured the Soviet Union into Afghanistan in 1979, that that was the plan all along, and that the plan was to give them their own Vietnam. And they all feel, all the neocons think this was a great success. They don't even, like, it, it didn't even phase them when 9-11 happened. And they're like, oh, maybe there was some unintended, unintended consequences to funding uh, Osama bin Laden and training him on how to lure a foreign power into Afghanistan. Um, but they go, well, it brought down the Soviet Union. So, okay, it's worth it. And I think this, a similar type of calculation is being made now at the expense of the Ukrainian people. And I, okay. I think you don't want America in this, man, like. But anyway, I hear you. So, so let me, let me go back, Michael, to what you said, which is about the negotiations. I think this is part of what you're talking about as well, Dave, which I think is the important part. Um, what what we're talking about is not like uh, Zelensky was like, oh, let's do a deal because th there's good options here. He was like, we're we're about to get slaughtered. The country is about to be right. overrun. Let's do a deal where we essentially submit to Russia. We accept all their demands. But uh, maybe he gets to stay in power. Maybe he even doesn't. I don't know. No, none of us know what was on the table. Exactly. Right. But it's not like there was a great deal on the table and the evil. By the way, I would like to publicly disassociate myself from Boris Johnson, just <laughs> in case there's any misunderstanding there. Only Theresa May got it. Yeah, well, all of them. <laughs> uh, but my, my point is this, like Boris Johnson, if to the extent that he did interfere with that, what I imagine would have been the conversation, none of us knows what actually happened. 
it would have been like, look, if you want to keep fighting, we'll help you to defend your country, right? It's not like the deal was a good deal that would have solved this problem, particularly for the long term, as we remember, we talked about how do we prevent this happening again. So I think that's a really important point. I don't believe the goal here is to prolong the conflict as long as possible. I think that the, the deal, the, the, the goal here is to prevent Russia from winning. I think that's what the goal is. Um, and Ukrainians are actually very keen to, to fight. This, this isn't like we made them fight to defend okay. their country. They are... I know personally dozens of men who've literally, the day that it happened, they took their family, drove them to the border, put them on a train to Poland, turned around and went back and signed up to fight, right? So it's not like we are making them do this. They are volunteering because they want to defend their country. And we are saying to them, we will support you financially and with weapons and with kit and whatever in order for you to be able to do that. So I think sometimes people... Um, when they talk about proxy war and whatever, they sort of make Ukrainians agency less in this conversation. And I promise you, if you actually speak to, to Ukrainians, they're really, really not, right? Like the, 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 the national sense of national spirit and people pulling together is very strong. You know, my grandmother gives a pension to the army uh, and, yeah, and like yeah. stuff like that. So I think that's important yeah, to well, keep I in think, mind as well. Well, I think, I think that last Wait, hold part- on, Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me just say right. something, something sure. here because to, to what you just got constant in, I can just kind of back up what you said a little bit. I think it's hard for Americans to appreciate the level of hatred by the Ukrainians toward the Russian. And I'll give an example. I, I, I over 15 years ago, I just met a girl. She was from Ukraine. I, again, speak Russian, not Ukrainian. And, you know, she was very westernized. Her boyfriend is African-American. So as we're leaving, I just said, Ochimpriatna, you know, like, nice to meet you in Russian. And she looked at me like I had punched her in the stomach. Like even speaking Russian to a Western Ukrainian to her was like horrifyingly offensive. So I think to your point, with my concern about being a proxy war, the level of animus and for good reason by right. Ukrainians toward Russians is something that we Americans don't have toward another country, even you know, I, I can't even think of anything. Go ahead, Dave. Sure. Please. Yeah. No, I think I think that that's essentially right, and I do think that um, there's there's no question people don't like very much being invaded, and I think even many of the ethnic Russians um, who would have been more uh, viewed Russia more favorably previous to the invasion have been pushed in the other direction. Um, there's yeah. there's some evidence to show that that's the there's case. A lot, and I've heard a lot of evidence stories right. about it, that, and that sounds right to me. I mean, I think that's. That that makes sense. I don't think it's a binary of if you like, you know, like if you say that like the Sandinistas and the Conquistas were like or whatever were like funded by the Americans or by the Soviet Union, that doesn't mean those weren't real people who really hated each other and really wanted to fight a war. You know what I mean? But it's also true that they were funded by the Soviet Union and the United States of America. So it's like and I think. So I, I agree with you. I don't think any of this should take agency away from Ukrainians. And I, I agree with you that there's certainly lots of them that want to fight, although they are also forcing a whole lot of people to fight. So it's kind of uh, it's impossible to exactly know who wants to be there and who doesn't, because if you're a military age man in uh, Ukraine right now, you don't have Can a I, choice. Jay, may I um, jump in just on that one point very sure. quickly, if it's OK with you? Uh -huh. I mean, at the beginning of the war. Uh, there are two things that are kind of useful to know. At the beginning of the war, the list of volunteers was so long that they couldn't get them all into the army. And they still have a backlog of cases of people who applied to join. Now, you're right. They are also using conscripts. And look, a country of war is going to do that. But well, my point is there was a huge wave of people willing to fight. Sure. Another point I would make again on that is you remember, particularly in the early days of the conflict, they handed out AK-47s basically to anyone who wanted right. them. And none of those people ended up like uh, fighting against the Ukrainian government or like joining the Russians, right? So my point is the level of public support in Ukraine for Zelensky, legitimately, this isn't some inflated figure like you get in Russia, like 90 plus percent. And right. likewise for continuing the fight. So that's that's the only point I'd make. No, I so look, and I agree with that. I don't, I, I, I don't really disagree. I think it's it's pretty clear that the Ukrainians want to fight this fight, and they want more and more uh, support from the Americans to do it. I do think that your first part there kind of proved my point, though, 
that it's like, yeah, this is the moral hazard of supporting a war like this. Yeah, Zelensky mm. was essentially in a place where he couldn't do anything except negotiate, and he had to. And then we came in with $100 billion and have allowed the war to continue on for over a year now. And look, the, none of us know exactly what happened, but what was reported was that essentially the deal was going to be, the deal that they had in, in pencil, not in pen, essentially, but that people had in principle agreed to, was that Russia was going to absorb the Donbass region and keep Crimea, um, Ukraine would uh, promise to not join NATO uh, ever, or at least for a very long period of time, and Russia would pull all of its forces out. And right. I just like, I'm on, honestly asking you, look, what, what I think we should want here is, the, it's not like, I think what we should want is an off ramp to the violence where everybody can kind of save face. They can kind of say, you know, Zelensky can say, hey, we repelled the Russian invaders. Uh, Vladimir Putin can say, hey, we achieved our, you know, objectives and therefore, and then the violence can stop. But I mean, like what, like in theory, what would you say to that deal? If the deal was, look, the Donbass region is going to be absorbed by Russia. Um, they're keeping Crimea. The rest of Ukraine is going to be an independent uh, country with some security assurances and an agreement that they won't join NATO. Like, would you take that over what we have right now? Well, the, but this is what I'm saying. This is why we talked about uh, long-term security because Ukraine already had security guarantees. You'll remember the Budapest Memorandum. Yeah. Ukraine was made to give away its nuclear weapons right. with the assurance of security from the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, and Russia, and maybe France as well, I think. I don't remember the, the, the other party. So uh, any security guarantees that are not physical are not worth the paper they're written on. And Ukraine has experienced that twice now, in 2014 and again this time. Unless they have actual physical security, all this means is that the same thing is going to happen again yeah. a few years down the line. And we're going to be in exactly the same place with Ukraine having more pieces bitten off it, right? Yeah, but so, if, you could, if you could theoretically let, on, get let, out let, of let, this let, place. All right, sorry, sorry, go ahead. So, so the short term answer, which I totally understand my solution, I've been saying this from like the first of March of last year, literally a few days after it happened, uh, is, is, is that, but Ukraine needs actual security. Uh, and that's the sticking point, which is essentially what the conflict is about. Is Ukraine going to have the opportunity to decide its own future? Or does it have to be subjugated by Russia because it happens to be next to Russia? That's what this whole war is about, right? And, and, and so that's not for you or for I to decide. That's for the Ukrainian people to decide. Now, they seem to want to actually have the independence to decide that they want to be like Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Romania, and Poland, and whatever. Um, and that's what they're fighting for. And that's what they're laying down their lives for. And people have done that throughout millennia to say, yeah. this is our land. We get to decide how to live in this country. We get to decide the direction we're moving in. And that's what the war is about. Yeah, I mean, look, fine, fair enough to say they get to decide and I don't get to decide. But then I don't have to fund it. You, you know? don't. Like, fine. You yeah, absolutely don't. Well, that's why do. you have I a vote and you can do. vote for candidates who, who don't support Ukraine. Okay, and I vote against the candidates who support the war every time no, I'm still don't. forced to fund you it. You're a liar. You don't vote at all. <laughs> well, whatever. Okay. I never vote for uh, candidates who support <laughs> these wars. And if I do vote, I vote against them. And, and you should know, Dave, by the way, I have never once, I hope, uh, said the words, America should do this or America. I'm not an American taxpayer. I have no right to tell Americans what to do with, with their money. Right. Well, you um, could still tell us not to like kill innocent people in Iraq or something like that. Well, I'd rather you didn't. But, but if you guys <laughs> get together and vote for it, and what am I going to do? But anyway, my point is you're you're an American taxpayer. Uh, and you guys who pay taxes in America, you get to decide that through the electoral system and to elect candidates that you feel best represent your views, right? That's the way this gets decided. If I if I do at some point move to America, then I'll start telling Americans what to do just like you. <laughs> no, no, we're calling Fair ICE. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Folks, Michael Malice here, terrible author, horrible person on Twitter, and yes, sheath underwear model. Do you want to get inside my pants? Well, you can with Sheath Underwear. What's great about Sheath is their dual pouch technology. They've got one pouch for one part of your male anatomy, another pouch for another part of your male anatomy. The first time I put them on, I'm like, what is this crap? But then I realized these are the most comfortable underwear I've ever worn. I wear them every single day. It was developed by Bobby, who was an Iraq vet. So you know things get uncomfortable down there when you're in the desert. And I've designed my own pair. 
Uh, if you go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code MALICE, you get 20% off. And you could start one step closer to becoming an underwear model just like myself, but not as much of a terrible person like myself. Go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE, get 20% off today. What's great about this underwear is that it keeps you cool in the hot weather and it keeps you snug and secure uh, in any situation. And there's something a little subversive about being like, let's say, on a date or a job interview and knowing that your underwear is cupping your you-know-what downstairs. Sheathunderwear.com, promo code MALICE for 20% off. Let's get back to the show. I, um, I got a question for each of you, though. Can we do that? Sure. 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 So, Dave, Dave, whenever people say, have any element of nuance on this issue, immediately it's you're just Putin's puppet, Putin propaganda points, you know, your Russian agent, all this other good stuff. The, the most cogent question I've heard in this regard is if Putin is so concerned about having NATO expansion up to his borders, isn't his invasion of Ukraine just bringing his border closer to NATO anyway? so that he's just using this as an excuse to justify his imperialism? Well, um, well, I, yeah, I mean, I guess in a sense, then you could say, well, the Soviet Union had NATO on their borders. But no, I mean, the concern that Vladimir Putin has, and he's been very explicit and very clear about this, right? So first off, it's that the, from the Russian perspective, or from the objective perspective, NATO is not what it claims to be. NATO is not a purely defensive alliance that just says, hey, if you attack one of us, we'll all defend ourselves. NATO has fought several aggressive wars. Um, NATO was uh, fought a war in, Ser in Serbia. Uh, they fought a war in Libya. They were very instrumental in the war in Afghanistan as well. So from, from Vladimir Putin's perspective, this is the European arm of the American empire. This is not just some defensive alliance. And I think that's, I think he's right about that, essentially. Um, uh, that, I even I'd agree with that. Sure. So his he's been very specific about his security concerns, and they were uh, they, they were about the dual use rocket launchers that were put in under George W. Bush into um, Poland and I believe Romania. Um, and these were his big concerns. They brag the weapons manufacturers brag on their website that these can be used to offensively launch nuclear missiles. And his concern is that this now cuts down on the time it would take for a nuke to hit Moscow, theoretically. And his big concern is that, you know, in 1997, Bill Clinton promised that even if we do this NATO, this round of NATO expansion, we're not going to move any of the military uh, hardware into the new countries that we expand. And then they just broke the promise, you know, because that's just what like as 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 you were pointing out with the the security assurances to Ukraine, no no one can really be trusted in any of these things. And even whether it's on a Bingo. whether it's just whether it's just something that is said, like we're just we just in the two plus four meetings give assurances to the Soviet Union that if they pull their forces back, we won't expand NATO eastward. Or if it's something that's written in a treaty like the or written in a formal agreement like the deal with Iran, it doesn't matter. The next guy can just rip it up or just not pay yeah. attention to it. And so Vladimir Putin's, I, I think. I, I think he didn't actually it's not that he wants to absolve all uh, absorb rather all of Ukraine. I think what he wants is them as a buffer from yeah. against NATO military uh, equipment being in there. So that would be achieved either way, whether he took it or whether it was just not um, not a NATO member. And I think that Vladimir Putin ultimately concluded, which I got to say, I think he's right about that he ultimately concluded that they basically made Ukraine a member of NATO, a de facto member, maybe not in name, but in, I mean, I mean, you can look at what we're doing right now. This is as much, if not more than would be required of us to do for a NATO country oh, yeah. if they were invaded, what we're doing to, to support Ukraine. And I think he basically, after mm -hmm. the um, after the Yanukovych government was overthrown, when the Poroshenko government uh, came in, um, there was... Uh, a, a huge ramp up of weapons being sent into Ukraine, American weapons. This is, of course, famously Donald Trump got impeached for holding up the weapons deal to Ukraine. But the story that didn't get talked about as much is that he caved and he get, and he sent all of the weapons and he also got us out of the INF treaty. Um, and, and then also they were coordinating uh, military uh, drills with between NATO, America and the Ukrainian military. And I think at a certain point, Vladimir Putin concluded that like this, they just crossed my red line. I said over and over again that this was the brightest of red lines to me, and they just were like, well, we don't care because we're America. We can do whatever we want to do, which was always the neocon attitude since uh, 1991.
I, I want to make one point, and this is a, like something we're all going to agree on. One of the big concerns in the world is nuclear proliferation, right? There, mm -hmm. There's no question about that. And what I'm very scared of with this issue, broadly speaking, is that it's strongly encouraging nuclear proliferation. Because if you look at the lessons of North Korea versus Libya, Gaddafi gave up his weapons of mass destruction program, and he was personally raped to death. North mm -hmm. Korea prides itself on being like either a porcupine or hedgehog, depending on the translation, because they're a small country with nukes pointing every direction, and no one's at all talking about invading North Korea, although it's much more justifiable than invading some of these other countries. Mm -hmm. Ukraine gave up its nukes, and look what's happening here. Uh, so that's a strong right. incentive for small countries to become nuclearized. Go, go ahead. Well, th this is why I made the point at the beginning that Dave and I agree, and I'm sure you agree as well, about America's invasion of all, all of these other countries. But that also, that's also why we have to agree about Ukraine too. Like this yeah. shouldn't happen. Otherwise, yes, you're absolutely right. All of these countries are going to want nuclear weapons because that's how you buy safety, essentially, right? Yeah. And, and actually, and I, I, agree. What, uh, I would, I would uh, agree on much of what Dave said, not all, but much, and take it even further. This is something people don't understand about nuclear weapons that I'd like to get out there, and if we can use this conversation. It's not even about dual-use launchers because if you think about what the nuclear standoff is really about it's like two guys with a gun each pointing at each other and even defensive miss anti-missile systems that will prevent you from being attacked by nuclear weapons they're no different to an offensive weapon because if i have a button that can deactivate your gun that's the same as you not having a gun and therefore i can shoot you right so from that perspective, it's not untrue. On the other hand, though, I mean, Russia has uh, has NATO uh, countries on its borders already. And as a result of this conflict, it's going to have way more of them, even if Ukraine isn't one of them. I mean, Sweden and Finland are now going to be members of NATO. Um, and, and Poland is already has a small border with, with Russia uh, through Kaliningrad as well. Um, so... It's not a very strong argument. And if you look at the way the Russians are actually invaded, it was very clear that their objective was not to seize the Donbass and it was not to secure Crimea. They were trying to take the whole country or at least up to Kiev and east, which is why they invaded from the north and from the south. And their attack from the east was actually mainly about constraining Ukraine's forces in the east. So they, this was about taking the, the piece of the motherland that fell off Russia in 1991. This has always been the objective. They've always talked about Kiev as the great, uh, what, what would be the right way of translating it? You know, the mother city of Russia. In fact, that's where Russia actually historically originates. So it, it's a little bit more complicated. And by the way, people always get stuck in this like single factor analysis of it's like, Either they wanted security <laughs> or they wanted territory. Well, mm -hmm. most of the time it's actually both, right? So I think that. But the one thing we haven't touched on that, Michael, I know you have a question. May I just do this other yeah, please, little bit? Of course, absolutely. Uh, we, we, we talked about NATO expansion. And I think that, look, my favorite quote of all time, and my own team at Trigonometry take the piss out of me for using it too much, but it's the Thomas Hall quote there are no solutions, only trade offs. Yes. NATO expansion 100% has trade-offs, right? And pretending otherwise is dumb and people shouldn't do it. But what you also have to do is play out the alternative scenario where we didn't let Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, etc. join NATO over the, the 90s and the early noughties. Where would Putin's tanks be today? That's the question you also have to ask yourself. And yeah. I am... I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever that we would be back where we were during the Soviet era, where all of Eastern Europe is unwillingly subjugated by Russia. I don't think that is in Europe's interest. Now, if Americans feel that they'd just like to stick to their continent and, and be kind of non-interventionist, I respect that. Respectfully, though, I don't actually believe that would be in America's interest because America benefits from having this large empire, which is why you guys are the most prosperous people in the world. Okay. Listen, well, I just, I, I just, I got to respond to that there sure. because look, when you run these counterfactuals, like you, there's a lot more questions involved there. Like would Vladimir Putin even be the leader of Russia? Had we disbanded NATO after the fall of the Soviet union, which is what the propaganda for 40 plus years would have told you we would have done. It's the same way that these cold warriors all said, if you, I know, you know, this Michael, uh, Bill Buckley, 
um, who famously wrote, right, that basically, oh, I agree with non-interventionism and libertarianism. However, there's the Soviet Union, and therefore we need to have, I believe he called it a totalitarian bureaucracy within our shores. This was always the rationale of the Cold Warriors, was that we're small government guys. We just recognize there's this threat of the Soviet Union, and therefore we have to support big government just because of that problem. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, they all went, we got to go see about Iraq or we got to go do this or, or as they were collapsing. Um, and so there's yes, if we had just disbanded NATO, perhaps Putin never even rises uh, to become the leader there. I'm I'm just suggesting that, look, if you're if you're going to say that the if America didn't have all of these interventions, well, then it's also reasonable to ask, would there have been all of these responses to these interventions that that we've had? And I think there, they would be much less likely. And I really reject this idea that um, we benefit from the empire. I think that is all wrong. I think the empire, I think empire is a net drain for the people. There are people who benefit from empire. Certainly Lockheed Martin does very well from them. Sure. The political class does very well from it. It is an absolute burden on the American people. It's it's a huge part of the reason why we're 30 plus trillion dollars in debt, a huge part of the reason why our currency has been so devalued. Um, and that it's and this is why empires collapse. Um, it's because it's actually not um, it's not something we benefit from. We benefit from our market economy. This is why we beat out the Soviet Union, because we had a market economy and they didn't. That's where that's the productive sector of our economy. All of this empire stuff is just government waste. It's all, I mean, it's the amount of money that's just been wasted on blowing up bridges and then rebuilding them around the world is not making Americans richer. L all right, well, that, that's an empirical question that we probably don't have time for today. Right. Uh, it's it about like control of resources. Day. Let me just make this final point, and if, if we can then move on to your question for me, yes. which is Vladimir Putin came to power in Russia for purely internal domestic Russian reasons. It has nothing to do with NATO expansion. The reason he came to power is Boris Yeltsin needed someone to hand power off to that wouldn't kill him or put him in prison afterwards. <laughs> and that, that that's why he came to power. Yeah. No one knew who Vladimir Putin was. You know this. The, yeah. No one had any idea who this guy was. The, the, his whole rationale, the rationale for Vladimir Putin being plucked out of nowhere and placed in the position of prime minister from which he could be then elected president uh, was he, that he had no power already and therefore he could be trusted not to, 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 to punish the people who came before him. Uh, and also the other reason he came to power is that Russia was very unstable domestically, particularly with terrorism and, and Chechnya. Right. And so uh, he was he was really put in place to deal with that. So it, it doesn't really have anything to do with NATO expansion. But anyway, as I said, going into the weeds, Michael, go for it. You're welcome with Michael Malice is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Folks, most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, you're listening to me talk, but you're also driving, cleaning, exercising, maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you could be doing right now, which is getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you can save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Let's get back to the show. Okay, so here's the devil's advocate question. Why yeah. is it such a big deal if, for example, Putin conquered all of Ukraine and even the Baltics? No one is saying, I just, I'm sure it's not your position that he's another Hitler, another Stalin. There's not going to be, no one's arguing he's going to have a Holdemore or some kind of program of extermination. Why, from your perspective, would be such a big deal if he was successful and just totally annexed Ukraine to Russia, other than the Ukrainians themselves would obviously resent it enormously and with good historical reason? Well, it, it wouldn't just be the Ukrainians, it would be everybody, right? And 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 it, it's not, I mean, Hitler, he's not in the sense that he's not into ethnic cleansing. Uh, but in Ukraine right now, for him to stabilize that country, they would have to, there would be a level of brutalizing of the local population that would be necessary. 
uh, because you would have resi- you would have a resistance in many of these countries, um, and so you would have to jail a lot of people, kill a lot of people, brutalize a lot of people. But on on a on a geopolitical and civilizational level, uh, we come back to everything that we've been talking about, which is nuclear powers essentially get to do what they want, and right. so our job, in my opinion, as the West, is to preserve and expand our power and influence in in Europe, because that is how we guarantee our own security. And also, there is the small trivial uh, element of all of the people of Europe don't want to be subjugated by Russia, right? It's about not allowing an authoritarian dictator to come in and force other people to live by their rules, which I certainly think is one of the highest ideals that we can possibly have, allowing people freedom uh, to choose their own path. I mean, we talked about the the referendum in Crimea, which, you know, I have some (laughs) questions about, but that's kind of like the point, right? People should be allowed the right of self-governance and self-determination. And we, it is in our interest, in my opinion, to build a coalition of free nations like the ones that we have in Europe and in in North America uh, to resist authoritarianism and tyranny uh, uh, by military invasion. Yeah, I just, I don't really view... uh... I don't really view our nations that way. We've got a, a whole lot of, uh, I, I don't I don't really see us as a free country. Uh, I was locked in my house for uh, for quite a while over the last right. few years. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, Noam Chomsky once said before uh, he totally humiliated himself over COVID and threw away his entire legacy. Um, but That was insane. He, he's in his 90s, so I guess I'll give him a pass. But back when I he can't was wait to be I can't wait to be the world's most famous anarchist. It's just a matter of days. <laughs> I think you might wait. Michael's just um, going around sneezing in Chomsky's face. Well, I mean, you know, the unvaccinated should starve to death or something like that. Jeez. Yeah, anyway, uh, but, awful, you know, he yeah. made he made this point uh, years back where he was saying, like, you know, it's very easy. Um, and in fact, this is what they they would do, right? Like in the Soviet Union, um, they would constantly talk about how uh, evil um, racism. Uh, in in the American Deep South is and how yep. evil uh, segregation is, which is true. I mean, it's not like it's wrong. It's just like, you know, you're the biggest hypocrite in the world to even be focusing on that if you're in a position of power in the Soviet Union. And likewise, the, America was somewhat guilty of the same thing. You know, like you'd talk about how evil uh, what the Soviet Union is doing while some pretty evil shit was happening in your own country. And I do think that to the g- degree that we have influence, we ought to focus on influencing our own governments. Um, I, I don't have that much influence in the world, but I have a pretty big podcast and I go on other big podcasts and I speak, there's a lot more Americans who are listening to me than Russians are listening to me. Um, so I, I am much more concerned about the evil things that my government is doing. I think, for example, the idea that um, Washington, D.C. is going to remake the Middle East because of some violent person in the Middle East when they can't even control violent crime in Washington, D.C. is pretty absurd. Um, and I think that the, uh, more of a focus on that would benefit uh, the world. Um, I think that what you said at the beginning about like, you know, we oppose the invasion of of Iraq and for the same reasons oppose uh, Russia invading Ukraine. Well, I'm with you. I oppose Russia invading Ukraine, you know, but I also think that it was it is ridiculous for America to be picking a fight with Russia in Ukraine. This is just well, too, it's not uh, if we if we actually ensured freedom in one county in the United States of America, maybe I'd talk about how we can spread this freedom. Around well, the world. look, I, I I share many of your frustrations with the direction of travel of Western societies. Um, I really, really do. I think th- there'd be very little disagreement on that. But I, I do have to say this is probably the strongest point of disagreement in this entire conversation because we have a saying in Russian, everything is understood in comparison. The right. West is free compared to everywhere else. And we shouldn't confuse ourselves about that. The West is much freer, uh, much more uh, liberal in the good way, uh, in my opinion, uh, than any other country. And I say this as someone who's lived in many other parts of the world, right? Your ability to speak your mind, including about issues like the one we've just been speaking about, is way more than it is in any other country, right? Yes, look, people lost their shit over COVID and it it was outrageous and it was un- it was illiberal, unwestern, and it was tyrannical. And I opposed it and I spoke out against it. But if you did that in China, you'd be in a fucking camp, right? Let, let's sure. just be clear on that. So that's the difference. We shouldn't get confused about this. And we can we can walk and chew gum at the same time. 
right? We can address the problems domestically that you're talking about without also uh, getting confused about how free we are in comparison to other places. The West is free. Doesn't mean we don't have problems at home that we should definitely focus on too. Like solving crime. I mean, we, we all know, look, look, I've just come back from a three week trip to America. The reason you've got homeless drug addicts on your streets isn't because of the war in Ukraine. It's because right. of dumb policy for 40 or 50 years. It's about closing mental hospitals. It's about not providing the other things that you need. And it's about not enforcing the fucking law, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with America's policies in terms of foreign stuff. So I think that's well, where I, we've got to disentangle this. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll push back on a couple things there. I mean, well, there are finite, uh, um, like wealth is, uh, oh, let me try to put this, resources are finite. So it's not exactly true that it's like if we're focusing on spending a hundred billion dollars over in uh, Ukraine, like yeah, no, that is money that could be either left in the economy or spent in yeah. other uh, directions. So it's not completely. Um, but it's not going to fix the problems you're talking about, right? No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not claiming that the war in Ukraine caused the homeless <laughs> encampments in San Francisco. I'm just saying yeah. that like our focus should be on that, not on on the, uh, whether you know. Luhansk is ruled by Moscow or Kiev. Um, and what I'm saying is our focus can be on both. That's that's sorry to interrupt, but that's kind of no, the important point here. We should be able to I do understand. both. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, I do think there is a little bit of a, like there is something finite about how much we can do. Um, not saying those two things couldn't both be done, but if you're going to say, make the comparison between like, look, there's no question. Um, I speak my mind very freely and I'm a, a true dissident of the current regime in every sense. I believe every high level person in the current regime ought to be, you know, in prison. Um, so that is, that's true. the compromise. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's my moderate uh, compromise that I'm willing to take. Um, that being said, if we're gonna make these comparisons about um, like who has more freedom in their countries, um, then I also think it's it's fair as I did uh, before to like let's uh, all right no double standards let's just have one standard and compare who brutalizes more foreigners um, our military or Vladimir Putin's and in which case uh, we really don't you're come just out better at it way. that's different you're just better at it you know, you've got okay. more money but you've got a bigger military and you're you're better trained that's the only difference right okay. I, and, I, and I, this I, is the okay. point I always make this is the point yeah. I always make about this stuff is like. Um, I, I'm. I've got my my cards face up on the table. I am in favor of American and British uh, dominance in the world. I'm completely in favor of it. I don't. That doesn't mean I support the stupid shit that we do all the time. But I want our values to be dominant in the world because I know that if Russia or China were dominant in the world, that shit that you value, the freedom to do what you think, the freedom to speak your mind, you wouldn't have a tenth of that compared to what you have now. That's well, why Russia I support- Well, are never going to be dominant over the United States of America in that way. The idea that their government, uh, you think they're going to conquer the United States of America? No, so I think the, gonna... they, well, we, we talked about NATO expansion. In the absence of NATO expansion, Russia could be very dominant within Europe. That weakens America. Uh, China and Russia together could easily uh, become top dogs. I don't mean in a physical kinetic way, right. invade America, but they wouldn't need to. They just control 80% of resources in the world. And you guys wouldn't be dominant at all in the world. All they have to do is take over the Ivy Leagues, and then we're all speaking <laughs> Chinese within a generation. I've got one question for Constantine, then I'll, then we're going to wrap yeah. this up. Okay. My big concern, and I'd love to hear you speak on this, is that we're entering a Pearl Harbor situation because at a certain point, if you keep funding the war in Ukraine, doesn't that make Britain and the United States uh, legitimate targets for Putin to counterattack? Um, I... It makes zero sense for him to do that. It makes zero sense for him to do that. Uh, in an actual fact, one of the things that, as someone who is concerned about the risk of nuclear escalation, because I'm not a moron, right? Uh, everyone should be concerned about the risk of nu nuclear escalation. Everything we have seen over the course of the last year is telling me that the risk of nuclear escalation has gone down every single day since the war started. Okay. Uh, one, one of the reasons for that is Russia is essentially now China's bitch. And the last thing China wants is for any sort of nuclear escalation, proliferation, anything like that, because that immediately causes them problems. Because if that happens, South Korea and Japan are going to have nuclear weapons before, yes. you, before you can do anything, right? So China being um, 
there are trade-offs. It's not a good thing that China and Russia are working together from a Western perspective. But one of the potential positive trade-offs is that Russia is forced to be much more restrained. And when Xi Jinping visited Moscow, the first thing they did is put out a joint memorandum at Xi's insistence about non-proliferation and non-use of nuclear weapons, and it would be the worst thing for the world, etc. Uh, Vladimir Putin is the only person throughout this who did any saber rattling with nuclear weapons at all. He has stopped doing that. He's not talking about it, right? Uh, suspending their participation in the street, it doesn't really change anything very much in, in practical terms. Uh, and so uh, I, I don't think that we, we th look, I think we should always be mindful of it, but objectively speaking, the West has actually played their hands very well. Um, I always think of the scene. Do you remember in, in The Hobbit when uh, Gandalf goes to, did, are you both, did you both read The Hobbit? I, we, I watched the movie. I couldn't get through it. I anyway, I won't bother you with the story then. But basically, inch by, we've, we've kind of been gradually fe feeling the waters out. Like we could have given Ukraine Abram tanks and F-16s on day one. And that really would have been like... You know, you'd, you'd really be scared that that would escalate things. Instead, we like if you give them, you know, two tanks at a time, Putin isn't going to be like, well, we've gone from 28 tanks to 30 tanks. Fuck you. I'm, I'm, I'm pressing the button. Right. So we've gradually tested the waters. And what we found is it's all empty rhetoric from him. Uh, he's not going to attack America or, or, or Britain. He can't even conquer Ukraine. Uh, so yeah. I, 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 I don't think that that's really something that people should worry about too much. I, I so, wish I shared your uh, your your optimism on that. I think that the the greatest threat for nuclear weapons to actually be used would be if Vladimir Putin loses and loses badly and for whatever reason fears for his own life. You know, the, o the only scenario really where you're going to see nuclear weapons fired off is if he thinks he's going out like Gaddafi. And if that's the case, then you might be 100%. like, hey, I'm taking some people with us. A few months back, it was an incredibly dangerous um, a credit, incredibly dangerous event when those missiles hit Poland. And of course, Zelensky came right out and said it right. was Russia. And this, we had high level people calling to invoke article five here in America. Um, there, there are things like this that can escalate and get out of hand. Wars are, are not always predictable. You can go listen to John Kerry's, uh, uh, leaked, uh, phone call when he's talking about how they were funding ISIS in Syria, but we never planned on them go turning around and invading Iraq. That wasn't part of the deal. They were supposed to just uh, overthrow Assad. Th these things can get away from you. Look, NATO has been attacked uh, twice in the last year. Um, they One of them might have been accidental, um, but they were attacked. Poland w uh, had those missiles and the Nord Stream pipeline was an attack on a NATO country. Um, neither of them were done by Russia, but man, they, they tried to frame Russia for both of them. And the, we just don't know how this, how much this thing can escalate and get out of control. And that's why the, the priority of everybody should be to put an end to it as soon as possible. Okay. As so you know, I agree with that. Well, well I agree I'll, with I'll that. Let, I, I'll let you have uh, your closing thoughts. Then we'll go to Dave. Uh, and thank you both for going a little long today. Go ahead. Oh, no, no problem. I, I, for me, the closing thoughts are, I think people sometimes uh, don't understand how much they agree on because of the way that we now communicate. Right. It's actually... Uh, something I, I'm thinking increasingly about and wondering what the best way to respond can, is. Can I ask something actually? Don't you think that's yeah. by design? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I just think the fact that we communicate through the medium of social media about these no, issues. Sorry. I mean, don't you think the media has really made it so that there's no possibility of nuance on this issue and you're trying to have a conversation like this that your, your motives should be suspect? Hmm. Uh, you know what? I, I genuinely, I, I know that like that is a tempting way of looking at it. And, and every now and again, I'll wake up and I'm like, oh, they've written. <laughs> but generally speaking, I tend to think the medium is the message. Okay. And the, the mainstream media, uh, I, I have a piece on my Substack about, you know, talk, criticizing them about lying about a conference that I've just uh, been at and how they totally misrepresent it. I think it's much more about uh, the incentives that they have and the resources that they have. The mainstream media is now the clickbait machine. And so everything is, I, I saw that um, actually, I mean, I saw that many times, but particularly when this war broke out last year, um, the, the, there are mainstream publications that write about the war in Ukraine with a huge amount of authority that don't even have the resources for someone to translate Putin's speeches right. for them. So when I do it on my Twitter, they all follow me and read it and then write the, the stupid little articles, right? So it's a, a lack of resource issue and it's a clickbait issue, I think. 
But the other point I was going to make is this conversation only happened because Dave and I had a back and forth on Twitter that in tone and content was completely different to the conversation that we've just had, from which I hope we walk away with our mutual respect enhanced and people can be more informed about the different aspects of this conversation, right? But that is because this is the medium that allows that, which is we can sit down for an hour and a half and, and have this discussion uh, in, in a calm way. Whereas social media is really making us all into these uh weird like bite-sized conversation idiots that we have and i think that's really in terms of all of our public discussions that's really the big problem and how we get around that i have no idea i know that that's nothing to do with ukraine but i actually think that's in some ways much more important yeah dave your thoughts please um yeah I, I certainly agree that the you know there's something about twitter where it's like first off the fact that it's so short I mean, I know you can yeah. go longer now if you pay for it or whatever, but like the fact that it's so short it oh, and and it's just like, there's no tone. So there's, it's just this weird mixture where like the only thing you can do is try to like slam the yep. other person in as right. short a, a thought as possible. Um, I do think that there is, I, I think there's, there's a lot more to the problems with the corporate press than just the fact that they're clickbaity. I think that, um, you know, for example, when there was this uh this the um that discord leak i i don't know if you saw any of um there there was like a press conference with a pentagon spokesperson and like every question from the press is just how are you going to make sure that there aren't leaks in the future what's going to happen to this guy do too many people have this information and there's like no question about like oh hey you were kind of misleading us about this or that or hey you know like th that would be a much more clickable story. I think the the major problem with the corporate press is that they are essentially mouthpieces for powerful people. Um, it, they could have broken stories on how much Fauci was lying to the American people. They would have gotten enormous amounts of clicks. Lots of people who were doing that on the internet got tons of clicks. They didn't want to be on the wrong side of powerful people. And they're about to throw to a commercial break where, you know, there's like, Pfizer and uh, you know Lockheed Martin and and mm. Boeing are their biggest uh, sponsors. So there's there's a lot of different problems involved in that. I do agree though that um that it's we're we're very fortunate that we have these type of platforms where you can have kind of more in in depth uh, conversations. There's a ton. Uh, you know, I know you mentioned earlier here the, the kind of stuff like, uh, you know, Ukraine's a Nazi country or something like that. There's I, I do see characterizations of, that are very unfair on that side. Mm. But I got to say from uh, from my position, it is unbelievable. And I must say hilarious the level that you get when you come out opposing this policy mm. of uh, of supporting Ukraine endlessly. That it's like I, I always joke around with it where it's like at least um at least like during the House uh, hearings on, on American activities in the McCarthyite period, at least then there were some communists. You know what I mean? Like there were some communists in the country. There's no one in America who is like sworn loyal to Vladimir Putin and gets his information from Vladimir Putin. And the, the truth is that I think there's a long and very impressive list of people, even within the national security apparatus, who basically felt the same way I feel about this, that in NATO expansion was a bad idea, was going to provoke Russia on, and down the list. Um, but I do, I really enjoyed the conversation. Love to have you on my podcast. We could talk about some of the stuff we agree on, like woke insanity and COVID insanity Let's do it. and stuff like Let's that. Let's do it. Absolutely. Let's do it. Gentlemen, we're running out of time. Dave, what has const been Constantine's favorite part of this interview? Oh, I get to do it for him. Uh, his favorite part was when I turned them all around and he agreed that America has to pull uh, support for Ukraine. It's just it just hit him right there. All the points came together. No, I don't know. I think uh, I think I, I think it was a, a great, a great discussion all, all around. You are welcome. This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Pettisey. I love hearing people's stories of resilience and grit. This is why I created this podcast. We are very excited to welcome Jim Gaffigan, Yasmin Mohammed, Glenn Beck, Tim Dillon, Abigail Schreier, Jeff Garland, Ayan Hirsi Ali, Sam Harris, Heather Hying, Jonah Goldberg, Ben Shapiro, Glenn Greenwald, Sarah Shahi, Colin Quinn. If there's a culture of victimhood, then let's Tell stories of grit and survival. Subscribe and listen now on Apple Podcasts, 
Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. See what's streaming free all month long during Amplify AAPI Voices on Pluto TV. Watch shows like Kim's Convenience with Simu Liu and amazing movies like Meet the Patels and Jason Momoa in Braven. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies and TV shows available on live and on demand. Download Pluto TV on all your favorite devices for free. Pluto TV. Stream now. Pay never.